This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Five big predictions for the second half of the Michigan football season. Next on this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Looks deep for Anthony Clark. Waits for it. Nip Clark. This is no time for that. In the pocket and a sack. Tim Jamison. Brady gets terrific. Turns it. Get it. Touchdown night again. Schultz just before Brazil got him. And a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. Caught by Collins at the five on his feet. Touchdown, Michigan. On his way. It's good. He's 5'7", 179 pounds. A junior at Michigan. But Jamie Morris packs a wallop. And he delivers for Bo Schindler. And here's your first play. Pressure coming. Second. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And then Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Mount Robinson and Michigan. Winner. We're going to win the championship again because we're going to play as a team. And when we play as a team, and the old season is over, you and I know it's going to be missing it again. Michigan. Go Blue. Welcome to this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. I am Steve Dace. We'll talk to the maybe one and only reasonable Bucknut, our good friend Mark Rogers, coming up a little bit later on. But we begin with what we teased from the top. The second half of the 2021 Michigan football season is upon us, beginning with Northwestern. The Wolverines come in ranked number six in the Associated Press poll after being unranked in the preseason poll. Michigan up to number six already. It is the Wolverines' highest ranking in the AP poll since November of 2018. It's the 34th time that the Wolverines have been ranked in the top 10 of the AP poll under Jim Harbaugh. So as we look at the final five games of the season, because you know Michigan only plays 11, according to this show, Here are five bold-ass predictions for the second half. Let's start with this one. I think Blake Corum and Hassan Haskins are going to become the first duo in a maize and blue uniform to rush for 1,000 yards apiece since 2011. Now, you, of course, are going to remember who one of those individuals in 2011 was, the one and only Denard Robinson. The other player, Fitzgerald Toussaint. Fitzgerald Toussaint and Denard Robinson both rushed for 1,000 yards on a Michigan team that started 6-0, and and that was the last Michigan team to win a major bowl game, beating Virginia Tech in overtime of the Sugar Bowl that season. I think we'll see both Hassan Haskins and Blake Corum do so, especially when you throw in the sixth game there, since bowl game stats count nowadays. Next. Aiden Hutchinson, I believe, is going to be Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year. He has been the most dominant defensive presence down to down in the Big Ten. And while he's getting routinely double and triple teamed on every conceivable passing down, he's not quite getting the sack numbers he was early on. But now you see the guy on the other side of that line. David Ojabo is getting those sacks now. And he still is an absolute menace against the run. So I think Aiden Hutchinson is going to be the Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year. Third, I think J.J. McCarthy starts at least one game at quarterback. 
when you look at injury situations for quarterbacks around the country these days, on top of the fact that it's clear our offense is somewhat limited under Cade McNamara as much as we love the intangibles that he brings to the table. So I think one of those two things eventually gives way and J.J. McCarthy starts at least one game at quarterback in 2021, at least down the stretch here. Two more to go. I think it, I think you're going to see Michigan invited to play in a New Year's Six Bowl. And I think Michigan, you know, at 10-1 and one or 9-2, and two, uh, that will be good enough to be ranked in the top 12. Uh, just kind of a sneaky little good loss for Michigan this last week was Iowa losing to Purdue because the, the Rose Bowl is just going to take whoever the highest rated Big Ten team is that's not in the playoff. And if you had Iowa 12-0 and 0 and then winning and then losing the Big Ten championship, likely still ranked ahead of a one or two loss Michigan. Now with Iowa losing to Purdue and you saw they dropped out of the top 10 this week, which should not have happened in the AP poll. I, I don't know why Oregon's rated ahead of Ohio State. I don't know why Penn State's rated ahead of Iowa. And don't tell me they look better. I mean, do the games not count? Why don't we just go by recruiting rankings and who looks the best coming off the bus? Do we, do we, should we play games? Should we have records? What's the purpose of games if they don't count? But I don't have a lot of great things to say about the college football playoff selection committee, but one thing it does do well is honor head to head when it applies. So Iowa losing though drops it out of the top 10 and behind Michigan. And now you assume that even if they went out from here, the Hawkeyes are going to lose in the Big Ten championship game. So if you want to see Michigan returning to the Rose Bowl, then you got a bit of a lift from the Purdue Boilermakers over the weekend. And then my final big prediction for the second half of the season is that Michigan's, nice tumbleweed there, by the way, Michigan's longest championship drought in program history continues. We are on... 16 years and counting since the Wolverines have won even a piece of the Big Ten Championship. Michigan's never been to Indianapolis. I I still can't even believe that's the case, but it is. Nebraska's been there. Northwestern's been there a couple of times. Michigan's never been there. All right. Michigan State's been there. Penn State's been there. Michigan's never been there. I can't believe that, but it's true. All right. And I think that that drought, unfortunately continues because of an extra game that the Wolverines no longer play. All right, that's going to do it, laying out my big five predictions for the second half of the season. What are yours? Uh, Let us know here in the comments section. And now let me tell you about DraftKings. If you are an NFL fan hungry for a big win this week, DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL, it has you covered. New customers can bet $5.00 on any NFL team to win their game. And if they do, you win 250 bucks in free bets. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. That's a great ROI. $5 bets yield you, if any NFL team wins their game that you picked this week, $200 in free bets. You absolutely can't beat it from DraftKings. Uh, so download the DraftKings Sportsbook app right now. Use the promo code Michigan Podcast to bet just $5 on any NFL team to win their game and win 200 bucks in free bets if they win. You win with the promo code Michigan Podcast this week at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. And remember, if you or someone you know has a gambling problem and wants help, call the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services Gambling Disorder Helpline at 800-270-7117, 21 and older, Michigan only. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for full terms and conditions. All right, back here on Michigan Podcast. Time for this week's 10-Minute War with our good friend Mark Rogers, maybe the one and only reasonable bucknut in the universe. He's also the host of a fantastic YouTube channel if you also are a college football fan and recognize there's only two times a year, as, as a plaque that my wife just bought me says, football season and waiting for football season. Check out his channel, Mark Rogers, the voice of college football. Good to see you, brother. How you been? Hey, Steve, I'm doing well. It's, uh, man, been a good college football season thus far, depending on what team you root for, of course. But just looking at the action and the unpredictability on the field, I think it's been pretty amazing. But in the Big Ten, look out, because here it comes. Indeed, this gauntlet called the Big Ten East is uh, is about to unwind. I saw that Pro Football Focus today, three of, the, three of their toughest schedules left in the country are in the Big Ten. 
uh, Nebraska, Indiana, and Michigan State, the latter two, of course, in the Big Ten East. But let's start with Michigan. I laid out five predictions for what I think we will see happen in the second half of the season. Any of those you want to take issue with, or is there something yourself that you would like to add? Well, I think um, your prediction that J.J. McCarthy is going to start a game is quite interesting because I think there's quite a debate, and I'm sure you hear more of it than I do, among Michigan fans right now looking at what this team's accomplished and looking at the road ahead and thinking, okay, wow, we've made it to 6-0. and What is this team capable of, and what should we expect, and why not make a move now where we can insert J.J. McCarthy? Kate McNamara's done a nice job that the – Offense has had to be opened up uh, more so over the last three or four games once they stepped into Big Ten play, and he's been capable of hitting on 55 to 60 percent of his throws. He's Which is not good in today's field. college football. That's not good. Not great in today's college football. He has posted about 240 or 50 yards passing in most of those games, something in that range. So my initial thought was, what is he going to have to do to lose his job versus do you take the – the bold move and replace him, even though he hasn't lost his job because of quote unquote poor play or the team has lost a game or is woefully behind in a game and you need a spark. Is JJ McCarthy really going to, is his floor any lower than Cade McNamara's? If, if he doesn't come through and become a boost or a huge upgrade, isn't he still Cade McNamara and doesn't he get pr- better prepared against the best teams in the league for next year's run. So I'm starting to lean toward this J.J. McCarthy. Get him in the lineup. Let him go. Let him cut loose. I don't think he's going to be any worse than Cade McNamara. And, of course, the ceiling is enormous, and the preparation for 2022 is another factor as well. So here's where I'm at on this. I I agree with the decision to not make the switch yet because I think a lot of what has transpired here, I I think people don't really truly understand how wrecked this program was. And this is where I've just disagreed with you all off season. You don't make seven coaching hires because you just think you'd need a soft reboot. You got to recalibrate. This is like year one of Harbaugh all over again. It's from a, from a culture standpoint, it's just that from a fan and administration booster standpoint, it's not because of all the water under the bridge from the unmet expectations of the previous six years. But culturally, they they hard rebooted, man. They unplugged the TV from they unplugged the DVR from the wall in order to reset it. All right, and and a lot of what has transpired this year, there's a few areas of the team where they are championship talented. Running back is one, offensive lines the other, and then they've got. an an all-American or all-Big Ten level player at every level of the defense. And then in and around that, they're filling in guys that are developing in real time. And it just so happens to be the most important position on the field, quarterback is one of them. And and the one thing Cade does bring to the table right now is, and you saw this in the way the team responded from the three times it fell behind against Nebraska, where he ab- he was able to lead scoring drives down the field to answer all three times. And it wasn't like he was like, you know, Joe Montanying this thing. I'm only, a lot of it was just his leadership in the huddle, his presence on the field, okay? And so I, I wouldn't disrupt that right now because I think the chemistry balance on this team is as good as I've ever seen it in the Harbaugh era. It does look like a throwback to a Lloyd Carr, Bo Schembechler era of esprit de corps, playing for each other, playing for Michigan. But the minute that we hit the wall, if it happens, so to me, I think you, you, you let Cade McNamara play himself in or out of the lineup. Because if you yank him now and put J.J. in, I think you threaten that chemistry. But you have to have J.J. ready. Because if if you look at film reviews of Michigan games with the All-22, Devin Gardner, former Michigan quarterback, has done several of these. Just brutal assessments of, of Cade McNamara. Just just missing guys wide open for easy gains. Underthrows, overthrows. I mean, just you just can't win like this. You, you just can't. Even Harbaugh admitted yesterday at his presser, quote, we've left a lot of meat on the bone offensively, unquote which is about as close as he gets to player criticism because for all of his reputation antics, he is he is zealous about protecting his players in public, okay? And so I think you have to have J.J. ready, and I think you summed up the reason why. And Chris Breiler over at Wolverine Digest puts it this way, and it basically is a summary of what you just laid out, Mark. I've never seen Cade McNamara do anything that I thought, I, that I thought J.J. McNamara, J.J. McCarthy could not do. But I've seen J.J. McCarthy do multiple things that I know Cade McNamara cannot do, right? So I, I think we all know that Cade McNamara, J.J. McCarthy can stand there and hand the ball off 40 damn times. I think we all know that. 
right? You can do that, okay? We've also seen, though, multiple throws from J.J. McCarthy that we know Cade McNamara cannot make. And we also know that J.J. McCarthy can run in ways Cade McNamara cannot, which is why they're bringing him in now. And look what just happened with Oklahoma. You know, I don't think Caleb Williams, who played no high school football his senior year because of COVID, uh, I, don't, I don't think he's that much more developed than Spencer Rattler. I think what happens is because he's a runner and now you have to account for the 11th guy on the offense, that now you have to play more man defense against receivers than you do with Spencer Rattler under center. Under center. And that's the same. That's the issue that we have. You run a spread offense and the quarterback can't run it. Jerry DiNardo nailed this years ago when we brought Rich Rod into the league. He pointed this out on BTN. You cannot run this offense without a quarterback as a threat to run. And then if your quarterback's a threat to run, you better have two of them. Because then you're situ- looking at a situation with Ole Miss and Matt Corral running him 34 damn times in one game last week. You can't do that. All right. These guys get pounded. And so this is where we're at right now. We're running a spread that's not an air raid. So we're running a spread with a quarterback who's no threat to run, which means it's 10 on 11 every down, every down. And you just that's just not going to be successful against the teams we have coming up. So I think, I think you have to have J.J. ready, and I think you have a quick hook, but I don't think you hook Cade, Cade McNamara until he does it to himself because of the chemistry balance you don't want to upset at the exact same time. Your thoughts? Well, Spencer Radler is a hell of a lot better than Cade McNamara. Agree. I'm just using a, an example that's oh, no, real time. It makes total yeah. sense. It makes total sense. Yeah. But they were willing to make that move, but they got into a situation down three touchdowns uh, to a rival. And, and that's and so an example of what it, I mean. Spencer Rattler played his way out, right? He fumbled the ball. Out. He threw a pick. They're down three touchdowns. And, and I mean, the fans were cheering for Caleb Williams on national TV three weeks ago when Rattler's leading him from behind to beat West Virginia. Lincoln Riley was right not to do it then. But on that stage, the guy plays himself out of the game. You make the move, and then you move on. And I think that's probably what we're heading to at some point here with Michigan. Well, if life was fair and we're always doing the – good thing to do to an individual who's doing their job, then you keep Kate McNamara in. But if it's cutthroat to a certain extent, maybe I shouldn't go to that extent of labeling it cutthroat, but hey, we're here to win championships. Look at the way this could play out with Kate McNamara staying in the lineup. This team is better than Michigan State, I believe at this point, until I'm proven otherwise. If Sean Clifford doesn't come back, And if Taquan Roberson doesn't upgrade considerably, which I expect him to do, I expect him to at least be a capable quarterback with two weeks of reps before this Indiana game, and he may turn into something, but probably not Sean Clifford, then Michigan may go to the Ohio State game undefeated. And so then what could be the best in case worst scenario all in one bag would be that Cade McNamara leads them to an 11 and 0 season until they get to the Ohio state game. And then they're down 31 to seven at halftime. Yes. And they weren't proactive to make that move to get JJ McCarthy ready and get those reps and ready for Ohio state and start him from snap number one. But here's the thing. Do you risk being that record that you talked about if you make the move now that, so this you is, do. Th- this is the situation they're in. And now you know, there, I've, over the years, I've been plenty critical about how we have n- not seen the NFL Harbaugh at Michigan enough. But we do have the one college coach in America that does have a little bit of experience with this on the biggest stage of all with what he did with Alex Smith and Colin Kaepernick, right? So for that reason, I guess I kind of trust him to know, right? To know when that has sort of played itself out. And I think you can see that he understands that by... How I mean, how much more often and how earlier in the game McCarthy is now getting into the game. Now, the one thing we have not yet seen, though, is we've not seen McCarthy given a, given drives when the game is still competitive. We've seen him given plays when the game is still competitive. We've seen him given drives when the game is not competitive. But we haven't seen him given drives when the game is competitive. I will be fascinated to see if we see that this week against Northwestern. Let's talk about the Big Ten as a whole. You mentioned you are skeptical of Michigan State. I am, but I'm not. Let me explain. I don't think their overall talent level is that good. That's why their win total was originally three and then four and a half. So I agree that there is a limit, a ceiling to what they can do. But I'm not skeptical in that their coaching staff has done a phenomenal job if, if, if Michigan, if Harbaugh and his staff have done the best job in our league when it comes to culture rebuilding on the fly, 
Mel Tucker and his staff, I think, have done the best job in terms of schematics. Like, if you watch their passing offense, it's it's just basically checkdowns or verts. That That's their whole offense. And so Peyton Thorne looks like he's got great numbers because either those two outstanding receivers make plays in space or, you know, 50-50 balls, or it's a check down for a high completion, meaning they're not asking him to find a second or third read of the defense. And and those their, their staff, and they come up with a trick play every week, they, they, the, they have identified what their team can do, and they just play to those strengths re- repeatedly, regardless of what you bring to the table. And I do think there's something to that from an identity standpoint. What do you think? I think there's something to that. And I also, though, think that we've seen teams in the past that have played over their heads for a considerable portion of the season and much of that against inferior competition as Michigan State has. And I'm thinking, though, that what we just witnessed against Indiana is a bit of a harbinger of things to come. Not that Michigan State's going to play down to that level week after week after week, but they are the week of the, the, the weakest of the four challenging for this division. And I just, I don't think that they're going to be able to keep up this pace of play against the other three and sustain it because they just don't have the talent level. The defense is fundamentally sound. I like what they do in regards to not missed assignments. They make the tackles. They, they play Michigan State defense that we saw under the first half of Mark Antonio's tenure, except with less talent. And um, hey, if, if they would win the division, I would just, think that that's a phenomenal story that Mel Tucker pulls off, but I just don't think this this is completely sustainable, and, and I think that there's been a track record of teams like this that falter down the stretch because the, the lack of talent catches up with them. All right, give me one big prediction for the Big Ten second half of the season from Mark Rogers. What do you got? Well, I'm trying to figure out what's going to happen in the Big Ten West, so if I'm going to do it on the fly, I'm going to say that um, (laughs) I'm going to say my original prediction of Wisconsin, uh, I would like to see that uh, come through. What's fascinating is that Minnesota controls the division. Uh, They've got the head-to-head against Purdue. Of course, they've still got the toughest games to wade through uh, on that side of it. Certainly what I thought about maybe Maryland pulling off a major upset is not taking place. They have faltered. I think uh, the the big item in the entire league is the Sean Clifford situation at Penn State and whether mm-hmm. he's going to be able to recover and play at full strength uh, because I think Penn State has played the best football to date despite the loss at Iowa. Ohio State's still the best team, and I expect them to win uh, the Big Ten Conference. Well, the other issue with the Clifford thing is even if you get him back, depending on how long it is, is you know he with 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 that with that with a rib injury, he's not out there even throwing the ball around. Right. Like, I mean, they're not they're not even working on timing with receivers out of pads to stay to, to, to stay, uh, you know, prepped. And so you wonder throwing that timing off and now you're heading into the most difficult and important stretch of the season. So even if it's only a two or three week injury, it's not the same as, hey, guess what? I, I didn't play the second half against Iowa, set out the bye. You didn't need me against Illinois. But hey, let's just go ahead now after not playing football for going on three weeks, and let's just go right after the Bucks uh, in Columbus in the very next game. That's not that ain't the on the job experience, brother. That uh, you know your your training you're looking for. So that's the issue is is from a lingering standpoint. And then if he's questionable, the other guy's primordial lose, man. He ain't ready to play. He needs all the reps he can get. And and he had an un, an impossible situation against Iowa because you know he was lucky to get ten percent of the reps leading into a game of top five teams. So you got to get him prepped. And that means you got to probably make a call like on Tuesday or Wednesday at the latest. Can Clifford go? Because if he can't, we can't put this guy in getting 30, 40, 50% of the reps given the schedule. Their coaching staff's, I think, in a difficult position with this injury, Mark. Well, coaching staffs have had to deal with these situations before. You play the probabilities or you go with a gut instinct and you rely on your medical staff and, um, these type situations that you've seen before, but how many times have we seen somebody step into the lineup last second, meaning Sean Clifford, if he's not given the reps, he's got the experience. He knows the offense. Yes. He's going to be a little bit rusty, but I think that's the way that you sway this decision is you sway it 
toward, especially since you're the better team in all these games except for one, you sway it toward getting that Roberson kid ready to play. And Sean Clifford, he's got so much game experience that that uh, you limit the reps on that end of it. Mark Rogers, good stuff, brother. Thanks for joining us again this week. Always good to see you. Good to see you, Steve. All right, this week's Twitter poll results. Boy, this question is a doozy. This is the most voted in poll we've ever had in the history of our Michigan podcast Twitter account. We asked you, if Michigan finishes 11-2, including its first major bowl win in a decade, so like Sugar Orange Fiesta Rose, but the two losses are to Michigan State and Ohio State, would you consider that a successful season? And again, the most voted in poll ever, I just voted yes, because I just think 11-2 and two in general is kind of a successful season. But 60% of you said no, and 39.9% of you, or 40% of you, said yes. And that brings us to the feedback of the week. Because, I mean, the comments to this Twitter poll were absolutely in fuego on fire. Let, let's scroll through a few of these. If Harbaugh loses to MSU this year, the fans might break. Absolutely not. We've had seasons before, and I can't like this before, and I can't take another. You can't be 0 for against OSU and then be starting 0-2 against Mel Tucker. Unacceptable. MSU at a minimum, or he's got to go. I went into the season thinking 8-4 and four was the ceiling, so 11-2 and two of the major bull win is way more than I expected. How about this from Shades of Blue? How in the world can people say no? The expectations at the beginning of the season were at best 7-5, and five, and some were, were predicting much worse than that. And I really don't know what the Lord has to do with this, but thank you for acknowledging him. Um, let me see where else we are. Not at all. Uh, sorry, losing to your rivals is not a success. Keep going. Uh, Michigan State has got to be, to win, be a win from Stephen no- Nova. Novo, Novoa, uh, Travis Brayman got to beat Michigan State. They were expected to be terrible as well this year. Brian Sallow can't lose to both rivals, had no business losing to Sparty last year. Brad G says you've got to win in East Lansing. Disconcerting Signaler says if they go 0-2 to bleeping Mel Tucker and 0-7 to OSU, then they won't even be in a major bowl if we're being honest. Actually, I think 10-2 and Michigan will be in a major bowl no matter what, but I get the anger. I get the frustration. That is a been there, done that, got the t-shirt situation, says Hank Wetzel. Why settle for less than champions and best? Nice use of the Sterling Sharp gif. So, I mean, some of these takes, and then the, you, know, you go through this thread a little longer, They start people start turning on each other. Like you're a terrible fan if you think that's a successful season. You're a terrible fan if you think it's not. How about we just actually have a successful, something we all agree is a successful season around here for the first time in, oh, about 16 years. Wouldn't that, isn't that the perfect solution? Because I kind of think that it is. Unfortunately, none of us are in control of that, but that would be clearly the, the perfect solution to this dilemma. All right, that's going to do it for this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. Don't forget to like, rate, subscribe, five-star review, share, uh, follow, whichever the case may be on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or right here on YouTube. Help us to find more Michigan fans just like you. You can also follow us on Twitter in between episodes at Michigan Podcast. We will be back here next week to break it all down against Northwestern and then and then the gauntlet begins against Sparty. So all that and more coming your your way next week right here on Michigan Podcast. Until then, I'm Steve Dace and go blue.